something that's just amazing to me is almost every family that we know has a cargo bike that for the winter they have decked out with studded tires and they take their kids to school, they go to work, they do everything. Uh, you know, it's like sort of like the cargo bike is, is the Subaru Outback of, of at least of my neighborhood. Hi everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that was Daniel Piatkowski, associate professor at the Oslo Metropolitan University in Oslo, Norway. He, his wife, and two daughters are recent transplants to Oslo. So we talk a little bit about that transition and how the built environment facilitates a high quality of life. We also cover some of his past research and current objectives for helping advocates transform their cities globally into more walkable, bikeable places. So thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Professor Daniel Pietkowski. This is John with the Active Towns Initiative and the Active Towns Podcast, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome into the podcast, Daniel Pietkowski, all the way from Norway. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. All right. So how on earth did you end up in Norway of all places? Uh, it, it took a really long time to get here for a lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> My family and I, um, my wife and I and our, our two daughters, we arrived here on January 1st. We got on a plane in Lincoln, Nebraska on December 31st and got here January 1st. We got COVID tests at the airport and made it to our new apartment by about 8 p.m. or something on New Year's Day. Um, getting there was probably, yes, and so that's a view of out the window from our apartment probably within the first couple days because it snowed the first night we got there, and it was so beautiful and just this amazing, amazing, very picturesque sort of Oslo in the winter scene. And it looks like the snow has melted or been cleared a little bit there. But yeah, so that's the view out my kitchen window. Why don't you, um, why don't you describe it a little bit for the, the audience that are just listening into this? Because this is a beautiful photo. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I, I feel lucky every morning when I make coffee. It's, uh, you know, look out and you sort of, there's some, in the way background, there's some hills and you can actually see the, it's called the Holman Collins Ski Jump, where it was sort of like the big Olympic ski jump. And then as you kind of zoom closer up in the image, you see across the courtyard from us in our little um, apartment complex. So this, this group of apartments, there's probably five or six of these kind of rectangular courtyards and in the center of each one there's um this was right after christmas but the christmas lights are actually still up as of this morning um there's all these beautiful christmas lights everywhere uh because obviously it's quite dark for for most of the day in january um and there's a little playground there's actually an ice skating rink and you kind of all the there, there's lots of families with kids who live in these units and everybody can kind of just let their kids go out and, and play in the, the, you know, communal yard out front, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. And, uh, and you mentioned it's, it's, it's dark and <laughs> it's a little bit different environment. So you move there directly from Lincoln, Nebraska? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Directly from Lincoln. Um, for the last five years, I've been working at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln in the community and regional planning department. Um, and probably, I don't know, at some point a couple years ago, I started to think about what I wanted to work on sort of long term career wise. Um, you know, maybe it was a little bit of a midlife crisis. I, I'd be willing to admit that that's certainly a possibility. But I, I was thinking about kind of the, the different opportunities that are out there and thinking about the things that really matter to me um, and the work that I do. And so I started looking internationally and specifically at Northern Europe and at Scandinavia um, because just, you know, as, as a bike ped researcher, it's it's harder to get traction. It's harder to get money. Um, and honestly, in the U.S., there's mostly political problems or political questions or issues around getting people out of their cars. Whereas I think for a lot of European countries, 
Um, they don't have quite so much political gridlock. And so there are a number of technical questions, you know, like what do you do when you have a fleet of cars that is mostly EVs? What do you do when you've got 40% of your Forty percent of the people in your city riding a bike to work. You know, like what's the next step from there? Um, and that's, you know, that was really exciting to me. And so, I started looking for opportunities, you know, broadly across those those different countries. And the job at Oslo Met came up, and I was especially excited about Oslo because of just making headlines with Vision Zero and all that sort of thing. You know, this was 2019, 2020 was sort of the start of the application process. Um, Cause all of these things, they take a long time, no matter what. And then with COVID, everything takes longer. Right. You know, so I, it, it was a, a really long process. You made this huge move and uh-huh. you didn't do it alone. You have a family. Mm-hmm. So I, I get the sense that part of this was not just a career decision. This was also about quality of life for your family. Talk a little bit more about that because I'm assuming this is your daughter right here in the in the photo. Yeah, this is my youngest daughter. This is Phoebe. She's three. Um, oh, I was th- I remembered what I was thinking about, but can you remind me to go back to talking about the link between Oslo and Denver? Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so the whole family, we, I think, you know, maybe it was partly the, the pandemic, um, but we were kind of just like, man, you know, life is short and we want to try to live a less car dependent lifestyle. You know, we want to try to live in, you know, in a way that we're sort of practicing what we preach. Um, and so when the opportunity to come here came up, we, we jumped at it. I mean, we didn't jump right away. My, my wife made sure that things would work for her professionally as well. Um, but yeah, we were really excited to have our kids grow up in a setting where they didn't have to sit in traffic for 20 minutes each way to go to kindergarten or go to school or to go to soccer practice or any of those things. And so, yeah, that, that picture is, um, when it snows, we can take Phoebe to her kindergarten on the sled and she loves it because she gets a free ride and, um, we love it because it's a little bit faster than when she walks. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm going to pull up another image here of of just you know some of the the beautiful kind of snowy environment and and that's out there and 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 this particular image it's just sort of a, a snowy path and and it looks like there's some standing water off to the side that is you know clearly frozen but you know the 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 light <laughs> that is coming through and you get the little bit of the sun uh, so you mentioned it earlier it is dark quite a bit of, of the time. Um, How's that adjustment been? I mean, it, it, obviously Lincoln, Nebraska isn't that far north and, and, and you know, does get a fair amount of sun. Uh, but how, how's it been to adjust to that, you know, sort of new reality? Yeah, at first it was really weird. Um, like taking my daughter, my older daughter, uh, she's seven. We're walking to school with her at 8.15 in the morning and it would still be like, really dark or uh, picking her up at 4 p.m. and it was dark. Um, But the nice thing is that because we got here at the start of January, every day is lighter and it's really noticeable how much lighter it is. And it's funny, you know, I I shared with you a bunch of pictures from Oslo and they were all taken in the last three, four weeks. And it's been pretty gray, pretty snowy. And that picture that you just saw, it's like there's all these freeze thaw cycles. So, you know, we got spikes for our shoes because it's really icy everywhere. But in the last couple of days, the sun has come out and it is beautiful and the ice is melting. And even when it's like 35 to 40 degrees, everybody's sitting outside in front of cafes, sipping coffee because they're just I think they're just sick of being stuck inside. Um, And yeah, just the I can't wait for spring and summer because. I'm getting just a, a taste of how how beautiful the city is right. with the, the snow melting now. Yeah. And I pulled up this image here. This image is actually a cafe, and you can see uh, not only the pram there and also a lime scooter in the image, but mm-hmm. also uh, it, there's still snow on the ground. But, I mean, there's an outdoor seating area there and, you know, encouraging people. Uh, there is there is a tiki torch there to help uh quote unquote, warm you up a little bit, but, uh, yeah, so it's, 
I, I get what you're saying because I get the sense that as soon as things really warm up, people are really going to be outdoors and at the cafes and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And it's, and it is really funny, you know, the, the, um, the, the saying about Norwegians is that, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad equipment. Right. And, you know, that is absolutely true here. And there's a, a culture around physical activity that is just really unparalleled, you know, and that's after living in Colorado for a, a number of years, I can right. say that Boulder has gotten nothing on Norway. Um, <laughs> I think it's just, well, especially in the winter sports, for sure. I mean, I, I, I yeah. was, the, the, the Olympics are, are on right as we're recording this. And uh-huh. I was watching the ski jumping and they were like uh, listing the, the countries that had a uh, number of medals and gold medals in this ski jumping discipline. And at the top, of course, was Norway with the, the most number of all time, you know, <laughs> medals, you know, in that particular event. And I'm like, yep. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. They've dominated. So you yeah. mentioned Denver a couple times in Colorado. Um, I think that that's actually the very first time that, that I met you. Um, I came to see you, Denver, in the 2010, 2011 time frame and did a tour of uh, the university, the the PhD program. Uh, Kevin Kreisick was, uh, was still there at that time. And so he walked me around. I was th- seriously considering... Uh, doing a PhD, getting my doctorate. I, I have my master's from the University of Michigan from like, at that time, it was two decades earlier. Now it's <laughs> three plus decades <laughs> ago. But uh, at that time, I was like, yeah, maybe maybe my next step is is a doctoral program and, and all that. Long story short, I, I didn't do that. I, I ended up founding uh, the nonprofit Advocates for Healthy Communities in the latter end of 2011. And then in the uh, early 2013, launched the Active Towns Initiative, which is now, you know, morphed into this podcast and YouTube channel and, you know, trying to celebrate, uh, you know, all things active mobility and active living culture of activity. But I think I may have run into you in the hallways when, when Kevin was taking me around. Were you around in 2011? Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. was there from around 2008 to about 2012 or 13. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah. And, and we've run into it multiple times, you know, at, uh-huh. at CNU and, and, uh, we, we think that we probably ran in, into each other at, uh, uh, ALR, the active living research conference at some point in time mm-hmm. back when it was in San Diego. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it, that's, that's crazy to think of. And it's also crazy to think that that's been over a decade ago. It ha- but, yeah, it, yeah. It, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's been over a decade. I've been doing uh, active towns for, you know, well over a decade now. And, and I was thinking about that this morning. I'm going, wow. I'm pretty sure I ran into Daniel in the hallways there Uh, because it it made sense uh, that, that, you know, Kevin would have said, hey, you need to meet this guy because I was Mm -hmm. really talking about doing a multidisciplinary thing, uh, uh, doing some cross work into uh, the health, uh, public health arena and which is where my background is is in. And uh, so, yeah. Long story short, here we are back again, yeah. <laughs> back together again. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so there is that other connection that you were just uh, wanting to talk about, which was the connection between uh, Oslo and Denver. Talk a little yes. bit more about that. Yeah. So um, thank you for bringing things back around to that. Um, one of the reasons that I was especially excited about this job in Oslo was that there's a lot of parallels that I see between Denver in particular, but also just Western U.S. cities. Um, I grew up, I'm originally from Ohio, but I really grew up in Phoenix. I went to high school and college in Phoenix and then moved up to Denver for my Ph.D. And those both of those places, they're very, you know, they're sort of these, these cities that are growing really quickly, but they're also surrounded by all of this beautiful nature. And much like Oslo. Um, The difference being that every time I go back to visit Denver and every time I go back to visit Phoenix, it's just more sprawling and more traffic and more of all the things that I I wish weren't happening in American cities. That's not to say that Oslo has it all figured out. Um, That is to say, though, to get back to the, the start of this conversation, that 
Oslo is working harder than many other cities, um, particularly on that regional level, to try to figure out how do you grow sustainably? How do you be a city um, without destroying all the, the beautiful things around you that were probably why people lived there to begin with when they founded that city? Um, so that was kind of um, another one of the uh, professional priorities as I thought about uh, trying to get this job. You mentioned uh, suburbs and, and things of that mm -hmm. nature. You know, I'm pulling up an image here that you sent to me of a typical Oslo suburb. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you, 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 you cut your teeth in, you know, you grew up in, in the Phoenix area. You spent some time in, in obviously in Colorado and Denver, and then you were over in Lincoln. You also spent time in Savannah. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you look at, you know, the, the reality of like this particular image of an Oslo suburb and you then back that out and you compare it to the auto dominated car centric uh, approach that North America took in terms of their suburbs, there's a big difference. And you had mentioned it earlier, Oslo uh, is really serious about uh, vision zero and getting to the point of decreasing um, their serious injuries and fatalities. I think that they had done a really good job this past year, or I, I'm not sure when the data was, but I think uh, in the entire year, there was like one fatality or something along those lines. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that, because there's a connection between the image that we're looking at, which is this older uh, suburb, this 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 actually, this image reminds me of the neighborhood I'm in right now in Austin, uh, mm -hmm. a first ring uh, suburb that was, you know, really developed in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, compare and contrast a little bit, because that's a, one of our biggest challenges. And I think part of the studies, some some of the, the work that you've done is, is like looking at this reality that we have in North America. Yeah, so... I mean, first, it's I've only been here a month, so I really want to be careful about generalizing about anything, because right. if there's one thing I know, it's that I don't know anything. Um, and so, like, this picture is taken from the, the jogging loop that my wife and I will usually do, like, in the mornings or whatever. And this is this is the kind of place that I have always tried to live in in the U.S. That's sort of like you're describing that sort of first ring inner suburb um that in the US that's that's where they've been grandfathered into still having some corner stores hopefully right. you know still having a little bit more walkability um having a little bit more flexibility in the zoning at least when they were first built now the interesting thing about that similar setting in Oslo is that it's it's just like it's that but it taken to some more logical ends and what I mean by that is you just continue to let that develop and grow and flourish, um, you know, allow for flexibility in the housing, allow for, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these places are not single family homes. You know, a lot of these are duplexes and that sort of thing. Um, the streets are really narrow. I didn't include a picture of the streets, but they're extremely narrow compared to U.S. standards. Um, there's lots of modest but really effective bike ped investments and or interventions that keep the traffic low and the safety really high. And it's it's the kind of thing that I look at and I'm like, you know, we are so close to to being able to well, we're so close to actually doing that in so many American cities, but we just don't and we just haven't. Um, so that's why I included this, I suppose. Now you just mentioned, you know, sort of, sort of the modest investments from a cycling infrastructure, and and I think that that bears, uh, you know, diving into a little bit more because yeah. it's true they don't have necessarily a historical level of cycling infrastructure that say the Dutch have, um, but at the same time, and this kind of gets back to uh, your original dissertation that you had is they also have embraced this concept of the carrot and the sticks in, in the sense that um, they've been making some pretty bold 
decisions in terms of deprioritizing the easy use of private automobiles. So talk a little bit about that, because that's, I mean, there's some, there's some really interesting stuff there in terms of the fact that, yeah, they may not have the best cycle network infrastructure in the world, but they are pretty bold in, in making some of those decisions that, you know, help to deprioritize from a policy standpoint, the ease, easy use of automobiles everywhere. Yeah. And I mean, and I, and I guess I would, I would underscore that by saying that they've done a lot of it in like the last five years, essentially. And that's, probably the thing that makes me the most excited or enthusiastic and maybe generally hopeful about the world is uh, Oslo has done a lot of things to, as you said, kind of deprioritize driving or, you know, get people to not just consider, but to actually change their travel behavior, um, change how they get to work, change, you know, all, how they get to the grocery store and pick up their kids, all that kind of thing. And they've done it all really recently. And I think they've, they've recognized that, um, Sure, there's a long way to go. I mean, this isn't Amsterdam, but that said, it's like you got to start somewhere. And when you start doing something, you start to see results really quickly. And I think that that's what's so incredible here is it's it's happened really rapidly. Um, there's a lot of momentum, especially with all of the successes with Vision Zero. Um, and, and I think that that's going to propel things forward. And, it, you know, you sent along this particular photo, which is a photo of, is this a cafe or a grocery store or a bakery or something like that? Yeah, this is like a, a, a cafe slash bakery. And in front of it is uh, you know, a really nice uh, cargo bike. And then it looks like a pram there as well. Um, and, and so it, it when we talk about the policies that they were implementing and putting in place, um, how are those policies helping support what we're seeing in this image, which are, are people feeling safe and comfortable to be able to venture out on cargo bikes and, and, and venture out with, you know, with their prams versus uh, loading everything into an automobile and coming into the city center? Yeah. Um, in terms of how the road looks and, that's, and the users of the road, there's a lot of going from four lanes of, of car traffic to two lanes of vehicle traffic and then bus lanes and either fully protect, protected or grade separated bike lanes or at a minimum just sort of like, I don't really know the term, but color coded essentially, you know, like the, the maroon asphalt instead of, instead of the, the black asphalt. And so you have those sort of things, just changes to the, the roadway. Then, you know, you've got getting rid of parking, making it more difficult to park. Um, then there's also, there's, I don't know the specifics, but apparently there's some like subsidies or, or subsidy programs around cargo bikes. Um, and so that has been extremely successful in, in getting people out on cargo bikes. And something that's just amazing to me is almost every family that we know has a cargo bike that for the winter they have decked out with studded tires and they take their kids to school, they go to work, they do everything. Uh, you know, it's like sort of like the cargo bike is, is the Subaru outback of, of at least of my neighborhood. Um, and so you have, uh, yeah, maybe there's a cultural component, people really enjoying being active and also enjoying having the right equipment to be able to do so. But then there's the physical infrastructure component and there's the, the policy components of just it's a challenge to own and drive and park and store a car, uh, much more so than in the U.S. So all of those things really work together to really dramatically impact mode, mode share in Oslo. Yeah. The one thing I didn't hear you actually say was speed. What, what, is, the, what is the approach to, to speed, motor vehicle speeds in, in the area? Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for bringing that up because um, – that is one of the keys, I think, to their success with Vision Zero is speeds are really low, you know, 30 kilometers an hour kind of kind of speeds. Um, and there's a lot of like speed tables. So where there's pedestrian crossings, there's kind of those those long speed bumps, essentially. Um, and the other thing is bikes and peds have priorities. So if you step out into the road, the cars stop for you and 
that alone, just, just knowing that that's going to happen is huge. And, and then every day seeing it happen, um, I still have sort of the, uh, this American fear of, of stepping out into traffic. And I, I still find myself making eye contact all the time and, and, and looking for these cars. But there's so many people that I just see just heading straight out into the, into the road in the crosswalks, um, you know, with the signal, those sorts of things. Um, so very, there's a lot of rules that, that we try to follow. Um, but the cars just stop. And if they go slow, so they can stop. So with those really simple things just matter so much. Now, I know you're not necessarily a, an expert in this particular area, but when it comes to kind of rule following, um, I know the Danes are big rule followers. <laughs> they, 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 I mean, if you're, if you're not recycling the, the, your trash in the exactly right way, your neighbors will let you know. And it, it, it spills over to the way that they, um, you know, ride their bikes and, 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 and the dynamic that happens out on the road. Um, do you, do you get a sense as to, you know, from a Norwegian perspective, are, are they, are they, is that part of the reason why, uh, the motors seem to be that much more, adherence, you know, that, that additional adherence to, you know, the quote unquote, the rules of the road is that, you know, they are kind of rule followers. I, I think to a certain extent, that's true. I don't want to generalize too much because I don't know that much not having been here for very long. Um, that said, there's a lot of, well, and that's, and that's also a re- reason why I prefaced it by saying it's not necessarily your area of expertise, but yeah, you did, yeah. but you did write an interesting article about rule following, which we'll talk about in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, there's also, um, there, there's a lot of, a lot of penalties and they're, they're pretty substantial for speeding, for, um, you know, driving even with small amounts of alcohol in your system. Like, you know, there, there's a lot of, of, of penalties and regulations that I, I think are, are helpful. But yeah, I, I think in general, as a society, people seem, it seem here to, to have kind of, um, I don't know. I they seem to follow the the, the rules um, maybe more so than in my experience in the U.S. And I guess maybe you also see that with like um, the COVID restrictions. I was joking with a friend of mine about how um, you know there's sort of the the government here has announced various restrictions throughout the pandemic, and people are like, okay, so that's what we're going to do until the next press conference when we find out what we'll do next. Um, and just you know, thinking about the, um, the the contentiousness the contentiousness of all of that in the U.S. Um, compared to how the people in the press here have addressed that, I think there's just a different relationship with um, with rules here than um, than I've been used to in in my experience in the states. Yeah, yeah. But they're not completely all buttoned up. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> We're looking at an image here of some really cool uh, graffiti and some art, you know, uh, on the various walls and, and, and everything. So it, it's, uh, again, not, not completely prim and proper in all aspects. I mean, there's some art expression and, and stuff going on. So don't... Uh, don't don't send the uh, the hate, hate, hateful comments here. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, it, we're we're not generalizing too much. We just want right. to you know, let everybody know. Uh, talk a little bit about this this space. Is this sort of a, like sort of an edgy little area of town, or maybe an art district? Yeah, this is kind of the um, the the art district, kind of the the young hip area or whatever. Um, and it's uh, you know, I, so unfortunately, this is not a. a I, this picture doesn't do it justice, you know, um, you got to see it with, with better light and, and less gray ice everywhere. Um, but this is a block off of, uh, a really, you know, a, a multi-block sort of semi-pedestrian area that has lots of shops, lots of restaurants, kind of the quintessential, uh, new urbanist dream of, of a neighborhood. And these, this is the kind of the, the hip young area, uh, I think just because there's probably more bars per capita than in other parts of Oslo. But in terms of the built environment, everything in the city center and in the neighborhoods around the city center, including my neighborhood, are really at this scale that is just so inviting. And the kind of thing that so many urban designers I know are talking about when they say things like a human scaled city. Um, and that actually is something that I've just really loved about being in Oslo is just 
just being in a really walkable place that's built to be experienced at two miles an hour or whatever. Um, and what people do with those spaces, particularly when the, the city government has made a commitment to making streets for people and making them safer and making them more inviting and getting rid of parking and, and closing streets to cars and that sort of thing. In this image that we're looking at right now, um, you can see that the sidewalk is is basically been trodden to the point where it, it's a pretty icy surface. So uh, I, I know that that's always a, an issue in in North America and in, in Boulder and Denver is like shovel your, your your sidewalks, please, because it'll turn into black ice and things of that nature. And I need to stop saying things of that nature. <laughs> it's like one of those things that I keep saying over and over again. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, what is the what is the kind of the thought process here? Is the thought process you know, hey, wear wear shoes that you're not going to slip around on, or or is this something where you know, from a Vision Zero kind of perspective and whatnot? I said whatnot as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what's what what do you think is the uh, the kind of the approach from a maintenance perspective, because I know that's one of the themes that always comes up every winter is, hey, you know, calling on cities. Hey, you've got to, you know, maintain your sidewalks better and you got to maintain your cycle paths better. Uh, mm -hmm. But in an area where the snow just keeps coming in it, is this a, a, a typical condition? So uh, I, I have to sort of, um, you know, Please don't don't destroy me in the comments because I really don't know a lot about this um, sort of like things like city maintenance and that sort of thing in Oslo. One thing that I do know is that everybody here has told me that this winter has been particularly icy. Like there's been more than usual uh, these freeze thaw cycles, and so um, this is kind of a, a new thing. But that said, everybody has spikes on their shoes. Ninety. 9% of the bikes I see and the cargo bikes I see out there have studded tires. So um, I think regardless of the, the cause, because I really don't understand the, what's going on there, um, it doesn't seem to be slowing anybody down, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that it, we can kind of relate to the the approach that, uh, like if I'm thinking about some of the recent uh, posts that I've seen from Finland, is, you know, they'll, they will go through and, uh, expect that <laughs> the snow is going to be around. So the treatment that they're doing to the, the cycle paths are, are such that make that snow that's there more grippy. It's going to be there for, for months. <laughs> Most likely you're not getting that freeze thaw, you know, cycle to the point where it, you get the icy conditions, which is, you know, something that you saw there. So one of the things I wanted to, to come back to is, you know, the, the speed of the motor vehicles and the sense of courtesy that people have, you know, yielding to folks, um, in, in the Netherlands in particular, one of the mantras that, you know, kind of comes out is that, well, yeah, of course, you know, everybody who's driving is probably also a, a cyclist as well. And so they're going to be yeah. more courteous because they, they see that person. Do you get the sense that that's also part of it or, is there something else going on that, you know, could be happening? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to rule out other possibilities, but one thing that I'm constantly amazed by is I've heard a, a car horn maybe twice, and my daily commute is across the downtown area and around the downtown area, you know, through like very urban areas, and you just don't you don't see the kind of animosity and the like the road rage and the, the screaming and shouting that you you see other places and keep in mind that that's 100 percent anecdotal um but uh I, i'll take it you know and it, it's refreshing to see honestly um but like the other thing is that the pedestrian really is king here the bike everybody stops when a pedestrian enters the crosswalk and that that includes bikes and that includes scooters and you know, I can count on one hand the number of times that someone on on a bike, on a scooter or in a car has not yielded to me um, or to, you know, anyone that I've seen. And, I, and I, that seems to just be be part of the, the traffic system here that, that works really well. Right. The image that I've pulled up here is one that has a lot of pedestrians in, in the image. Um, 
what is your commute like? How far is it and, and how do you get there? Uh, yeah, my commute is, um, I'm about a mile and a half from my office. So, you know, 20 minute walk, I guess. Um, and my office is kind of on the edge of the, the center of Oslo. And um, you know, Oslo is sort of in the center of there's it's surrounded by mountains and then there's there's the ocean and this picture here is right where the the center of Oslo hits the hits the water. Um, so if you just kind of walk up the hill from the downtown area, you, you hit my office in five minutes from this picture, and then you hit my apartment in fifteen or twenty minutes. Uh, usually. Uh, my wife and I will split up and, and she'll take our, our youngest to daycare and I'll take our oldest to her um, local elementary school. And that's, you know, a, a 10 minute walk one direction for, for us both. And then we kind of, um, you know, I'll go to work and, and she works remotely. So, so she'll go back to the apartment and, and work. But my commute is a, a 20 minute walk through a really pedestrian friendly city. And um I've thought about getting a bike, but it's uh, I've, I've lived here for a month now, and I, I haven't even really thought, man, I need a bike, uh, which is which is a new thing for me. It's been probably decades since I I haven't owned a bicycle or haven't owned a half dozen or more bicycles. Yeah, well, we'll we'll catch you some slack. You arrived in the yeah. winter, <laughs> right. uh, but I do expect to see you know a bike and probably a cargo bike. Uh, you know, come come summertime, springtime uh, when the weather gets a little better. Um, so we, we alluded to it earlier. You have written in the past and did some research in the past about sort of that whole rule following thing. And specifically, it was uh, uh, an article, research uh, bit of research that you did with, I believe, Wes Marshall. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Wes has been a pa uh, past guest here on the podcast. So folks, be sure to uh, uh, check it out in the show notes and also in the video description. I'll have a link to uh, my interview with Wes Marshall. Uh, I need to get him back on uh, so we can get him on in the video <laughs> aspect because it was an audio only uh, experience. But talk a little bit about that, uh, that article, because it, 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 it kind of got some mass media attention. Yeah, that was, it did. And it was, that was weird. It's, you know, it's weird to be like a, a travel behavior researcher and, and have, you know, um, publications like the Atlantic and stuff like that commenting on, on what you've done and, and what, what its implications are. So this was a, a paper that we wrote uh, called Scofflaw Bicycling, Illegal but Rational. And we ended up writing three papers based on this data that we collected. And the data was really, I guess for the time, it was kind of unique. We, we did a big online survey. And by big, I mean it took people 15 or 20 minutes to complete, which if you've ever done survey work, like that's a shocking amount of time to have people sit down and actually pay attention. And we got almost 20,000 responses globally. Um, I think the... The total was like 17 or 18,000 globally. And of those, like 13,000 of the responses were in the U.S. So to have that many people spend that much time to, to work on a, an online survey was just crazy to begin with. And this survey was a real challenge, but it was a lot of fun because we, we wanted to get at how people behave when they're driving, when they're walking, but most importantly, when they're riding a bike, um, and, and get at kind of how people are breaking the laws, if they're breaking the laws, how much they're breaking the laws, and why. So we presented people a series of hypothetical questions, like uh, really stereotypical ones that, that tend to make drivers mad. Like, you roll up to a four-way stop. What do you do? You know, and, and people, you know, th th we sort of had a picture of a, a bicycle and, you know, you like your handlebars and pulling up to the stop. And we asked people, what would you do? You know, would you roll through the stop? Would you do X, Y, or Z? And we had five or six of those um, types of hypothetical scenarios. And one of the things, yeah, so, so here's kind of a, a screen grab from one of the, the posters that we did. And actually, if, if you go to uh, the Journal of Transportation and Land Use, jtlu.org, you can download the, the Scofflaw Cycling paper for free. 
Uh, it's open access there. So you can see all of these um, graphs in a, in a much more legible fa fashion at your leisure. Yeah, and, um, I'll, and I'll be sure to have all those links in and I'll have a link to, uh, I'll, I'll be able to get this uh, PDF up there as well so folks can see this or, or I'll do a screen grab of it and make it be a, a photo so that folks can see it. Great. Yeah. And so um, this was, so this actually, th this poster is taken from a subset of that data. So uh, I'll first uh, finish talking about kind of the, the bigger, the bigger picture. We looked at those 13,000 cases um, and what we saw in terms of why people were breaking the laws. Well, first what we saw was everybody breaks traffic laws. Right. Drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists, everybody breaks traffic laws. So it's not just bicyclists. And I think at the time that was, um, that was an exciting piece of data to have. Um, you know, we did this work in probably 2012 or something like that. Right. Um, the thing that was really interesting though about that was why people were breaking laws. And for drivers, it tended to be out of convenience or speed. You know, so they would break the law to be able to go a little bit faster down the road, you know, so driving at 61 and a 55 kind of stuff like that or whatever. Right, right. Um, pedestrians, typically the reason they gave for breaking laws was convenience. So that might be jaywalking to get to a, to, to a business mid block or something from across right. the street. Um, but for bicyclists, it was safety. That was the, the primary reason was they were breaking laws out of concerns for their own safety. And second to that was convenience. Right. And, you know, and I mean, I'm sure most of your listeners also ride bikes. And so I, I, th these, these results made a lot of sense right. to, to us as researchers and, and as people who also ride bikes. Um, so that, that was really helpful and useful information. I, I think it, I hope that some advocates found that information useful and, and valuable. That's something that I've always tried to do in my work is, is help the advocates with some, some useful evidence. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but then that, that poster, that was from a subset of that data, looking at what we call bike lash, right. um, you know, and that's the, the driver response to people on bikes. And in that big scofflaw cycling survey, we asked people some, some open-ended questions like, um, you know, what do you think of bicyclists who break the law? That sort of thing. It's it's been a few years, so I don't really remember the exact wording of the questions. Um, one of the things that was interesting, though, or the primary takeaway from that work was that people got mad at bicyclists based on how they thought they should ride, mm -hmm. not based on what the law actually was. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the all of that work sort of contributed to the larger issue of. We don't have a system, a transportation system that makes sense for anyone. Right. And it causes all of these problems for all of the users when really we've got these systemic issues that need to be dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. So you started your career off uh, again, you know, looking at the carrots and sticks you know, side of things and the incentives. Uh, you've, you've done this research, uh, you know, here uh, when you were there at, at CU Denver. And uh, how how has you know that 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 transformation been? And 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 I know that you did some other work when you were at uh, in Lincoln at the University of Nebraska of you know kind of digging deeper into uh, various aspects, even you know, like the economic impacts and and things of that nature. What what's what's the future look like for you now that you're in Oslo? And and what's your sort of key area of emphasis from a, uh, a research perspective, but also, you know, what you are, you know, teaching at the university? Yeah. Um, so from a, a research perspective, you know, I guess, like I said, at the, at the beginning of our conversation, I've spent a lot of my career trying to do research to help, to hopefully help advocates get the policies past that, that need to happen to get the infrastructure built or get laws changed or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and yeah, so I did a lot of this stuff around bicycling more recently in Lincoln. I did some work around aging and driving cessation, losing the ability to drive. Um, all of these, all of this research, though, has, has been, yeah, trying to trying to find new ways to, to crack that policy nut of how do we actually enact the things that we know will work? 
and I just got really tired of that, honestly. Um, so, so like I, like we talked about at the beginning of our of this podcast, uh, coming to Oslo is a lot about bypassing, I think, the immediate policy challenges in the U.S. to try to say, okay, for the the cities who are who really figured it out in the U.S. or um, you know, let's say the this infrastructure bill plus 10 other things happen that suddenly the U.S. starts to go, oh, you know, what did the Netherlands do in the 70s? Like, let's actually follow that roadmap and, and take us to that, that logical conclusion of really changing our cities. Um, if and when they get to that point, I, I want to be the one who's still providing evidence to get past there. Um, but I want to be providing the, you know, the technical evidence, the, the technical expertise of Here's what we know about how shared scooters interact with um, transit usage and with cyclists, and you know what that means for how we get around our city. Um, how does that relate to to land use and, and access to destinations? Um, how can all of these things work together to even in a place where a lot of people walk and ride their bikes, like Oslo? How can we? keep going in that direction and, 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 you know, make that even more successful and make the car even less of a necessity for daily life. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the really sort of grandiose, I suppose, um, career goals of moving to Oslo and the, the research trajectory here. But the, to get more specific with the research, um, I'm really interested in this, this intersection of there's a lot of conversations and a lot of talk around transportation right now because of all the new technology. Um, and your previous guest, Peter Norton, did an amazing job of kind of shredding that and ripping it apart and being like, it's not the technology. Like, that's a distraction. Um, you know, we need to be listening to people. We need to be changing how we use land in our cities. And, you know, that we don't need high tech to really make our cities livable because they, they've been livable before and they can be livable again. Um, so I'm interested in, though, you know, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but saying, okay, we do have these new technologies, you know, where can mobility as a service help us out? Where can shared mobility help us out? Um, but also what are its limits? But, you know, like, let's, 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 you know, take the wheel. Let's, let's not be, sorry for the, you know, the, um, the pun, but let's not be driven around by technology. Let's say, here's where we want to apply it. So, so that's what I'm, I'm really interested in moving forward. Um, how that relates to the, the teaching is it actually relates really closely. So I was hired here at Oslo Met along with three or four, uh, one of four new hires. And we're starting a new master's program called Smart Mobility and Urban Analytics. I'll be teaching a transport policy course, and I'll be teaching uh, an urban mobility course. And that urban mobility course is going to be kind of um, like a studio class equivalent, I suppose. Um, lots of lots of projects. A lot of it'll be a lot of class time. Like sort of, it's it's worth double the credits of a standard graduate class. Um, but the, the goal of this master's is it's it's pretty methods heavy. It's it's to give students who want to work towards you know sustainable urban futures the the tools they need in terms of all the methods, but then also the the substantive knowledge. Um, you know, so you know I'm technically an associate professor of integrated land use and transportation planning. So a lot of my teaching is going to be around that the substantive knowledge of integrating land use planning and in integrating transportation planning together to increase access to destinations, reduce auto reliance, improve sustainability, and you know, also you know, hopefully make our cities more equal or more just, I should say, more equitable and just. Yeah, yeah. One of the best lines that Peter had you know, from our interview is really, around the theme of leveraging technology for the future we want and, and, and not just assuming that, you know, <laughs> what we want is just more technology. It's like having some uh, intentionality to that. So I pulled up your website. This is your website. This is your, your, your sort of news or press related area. This is where a lot of the articles that have come out in 
mainstream press is located. I'll make sure that there's a link uh, in the show notes and uh, on the uh, in the video description to this video so that folks can can access this. Dates all the way back to 2014 of some of those original uh, studies that you did and that original dissertation that you did. Uh, I, I know that you and I could probably just continue talking forever and ever and ever, but you have a hard stop because uh, you've got to uh, take you know, pick up your daughter and, and all that. Uh, Daniel, it has been such a pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It was really exciting to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode with Daniel Piotkowski. I look forward to following up with him and the progress of his new department in the coming years. And truthfully, I've been wanting to explore and document the amazing transformations happening in Oslo for years now. And I should mention, if you'd like to learn more about these activities, be sure to check out this fabulous video by my good friend and fellow content creator, Clarence Eckerson with Street Films. It's one of my all-time favorite films that he has produced, and for good reason. It's a beautiful film, and it really dives into the efforts that the city is taking to try to become less car dependent. So be sure to check it out. I'll make sure to have the links in the show notes and uh, in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend and leave a comment down below. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that button down below and don't forget to ring the notifications bell. Well, that's all for this week's episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers.